Hello, and welcome to All Hands on Tech, where today's leaders talk tomorrow's technology. I'm Daniel Blazer. Two weeks ago, Pluralsight released a book called Perspectives on Technology Skill Development. This anthology is a collection of articles by leaders who recognize their organization's success depends on their ability to consistently build tech skills. Today, we bring you a conversation with four of the book's contributors. Don Jones, Vice President of Partner Content at Pluralsight, interviews Tanya E. Moore, Eric Geis, and Gary Beach about what technology skill development is and why it matters. We hope you enjoy their enlightening conversation. So, um, Tanya, I want to start with you. Why don't you tell folks uh, what you do? So just a quick bit about yourself. Sure. So, Tanya Moore, I am based out of the Washington, D.C. area, and I am a partner in IBM's talent and transformation organization. And so my kids often ask, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> I basically help organizations with the talent or the workforce component of their business and making sure that they're using their workforce to the greatest ability to meet their strategic objectives. So that's really kind of what I do. Now, what would you say, so we, we know we've got a technology skills gap in the world. Um, we hear about it a lot. Uh, we're even we're being told it's getting bigger, not smaller. What are some of the drivers for that gap? Why does that gap exist and, and why is it getting bigger? So I think there, there are a couple of things. And, and some of the things that we're finding in our research is it's not just a technology skill gap, but for many of these professions or these roles, to make their technology role work, they also need the soft skills, or if you think about kind of the critical thinking skills as well. But your point is taken in that the gap around skills, technology, and other skills is widening. And a big, the biggest reason that we're seeing is just the pace at which the world changes. So the pace at which technology changes, the pace at which you, things you can't predict like a pandemic. So there's a lot that happens in the world and it just seems to go faster and faster. That's the, that's the biggest thing. I think the other thing that kind of along with speed is this concept of because the world is going so fast, companies need to be able to do what they've done in the past, but they not only have to do it better, they have to do it faster. And so that's when you really start getting into anything that you need to do at pace, at speed, requires technology, technology skills. So those are some of the biggest reasons. There are other ones, but that's really the biggest driver. Thanks. Um, Eric, let's let's go to you next. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, so Eric Geis, uh, Vice President at Cerner Corporation um, in Kansas City, Missouri. Go Chiefs. Uh, I lead our clinical product development teams. Um, so the software engineering teams that are advancing our products for doctors, nurses, you know, various hospital clinic um, organizations. COVID-19 has definitely um, been very busy in multiple ways um, with our clients, as well as what we are trying to deliver at Cerner and a lot of the things that that Tanya mentioned. So I think, yeah, the industry is going to keep advancing um, healthcare as we know it, especially the public health side is going to have to advance really, really fast. Um, So us and our clients and everybody's going to have to partner to try to make that happen to deal with pandemics like this and other things that come up. And and what would you say to a business leader who who asks, look, what, why does this technology skills gap bother me? Because I'm I'm sure there's a lot of folks who think, you know, our business is fine. We've, we've got everything in place. It's not really going to affect me. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think you have to be, you know, it's kind of what Tanya said, the, the change of pace and the ability to go faster Um, And all industries and companies are a little bit different with that. But I think the really aggressive ones with a whole lot of demand are seeing this a lot and trying to figure out the best way to deal with it um, because it can be a real competitive advantage. Um, I think it can also kind of end, you know, your company if you don't have good plans and things in place. And it's very, very important to be able to retain and recruit talent. Gary, let's go with you next. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks, Don. I'm Gary Beach. I'm publisher emeritus uh, for Seattle Magazine, where I was for 17 years. And currently, I write a column for the Wall Street Journal, CIO Journal, that focuses on skills and workforce development. So with your work as a journalist and an author, let's let's pull back a little bit, take a higher level. What are some of the things you're seeing companies do to address their skills gap and maybe, maybe failing at, maybe not succeeding in, in closing that gap? Well, there's a realization that, that uh, certainly what 
my plural side is saying that, that training is the wrong word in terms of, of uh, their, their employees. They have to upskill them, reskill them. Uh, Tanya was talking about the pace and also the skill set. IBM uh, has interestingly years ago come, came up with this T approach to skills where the horizontal aspect would be your, your uh, cognitive or as pejoratively called soft skills and the, and the vertical would be the, 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 t- the tech skills. Uh, I think there's a realization over the last couple of years because the skills gap is widening and widening because uh, that there's just, again, what Tanya was talking about, the pace of technology introduction has been so immense. Back in 1980, there were only six or seven companies that uh, created or accumulated about 95% of the market cap of tech. And now it's, now it's 65 to 70 companies and all those companies have different technologies. So, so uh it, it's 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 that and and the fact that that people are realizing that that uh, customers I mean talent is your your most important c- competitive differentiator. So Tanya, let's maybe do a little bit of a mindset shift here. Um, Gary Gary used a couple of words there: training and technology skills development. Um, at least a couple of years ago, we would have called them the same thing, right? I'm a business leader. I sent my folks to a couple of one week classes. They, they got some training. I'm doing skills development, right? Um, but it, it's not that. So help, help, help kind of shift that for me. Yeah, it's not that. And what we're finding from companies that are saying, I don't know about this whole reskilling, upskilling thing because it's not working for us. What we're finding is companies that are saying that and experiencing that are doing training. So they're doing it kind of what I would call the old school way of, we think these people over here have a gap. We're not even sure, but we kind of think they have a gap. And we think this is about what their gap is. And so we're going to put them all through this class. And then we're going to kind of call it a day. And so that just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because you're not pinpointing, you're not personalizing who needs what. You're not personalizing the experience. Um, you're not recognizing that the statistics that we've had around for so long that people retain about this much in an actual training class. So it's not that training isn't important, um, but what we have found is that really creating an ecosystem that builds a culture of learning is what the game changer is. And so that is everything from understanding the skills people have, understanding what they need. It's giving them personalized journeys to the learning, but also giving them the ability to learn from each other because you can learn in a lot of different ways. This is where internal mobility comes in. The best way to learn is to try it. Um, Digital badges. So it's really creating an ecosystem you know, tying your skills to compensation so that it's the what's in it for the employee, that it's more than just, I'm going to a training class and then I don't know what to do with it or I lose it. It's really building an ecosystem that shifts the culture to one of continuous learning. Eric, what would you say are some of the barriers that we put in our own way as organizations that stop us from succeeding at this? Yeah, I think it's a lot of what Tanya just hit on. And I think the key word she used at the end there was continuous. You know, I think the whole brick and mortar trying to get lots of people together in training classes just causes delay and friction and and missed opportunities. Uh, So I think you definitely need an ecosystem that's agile, nimble, provides lots of different formats and form factors for people to, to be able to learn at their own pace and pick the topics. And yeah, you can give kind of some directional guidance on things as far as where the company's going and architectures and technologies and other things, but ultimately everyone's gonna learn at their own pace um, and and do some things their own way. Um, I do think this personal connection is still important. And I think with what we're all doing now with video conferencing and other things, it's definitely, you know, made that uh, more personal. Um, And I think we'll open up some more opportunities to do that as well as things like audio. If you're out on a run, out on a book, you know, out on a run, bike ride, something like that. How do you kind of leverage some other formats to still take on some of those things and and advance where you want to and when you want to? Gary, how important is it if I'm I'm a business leader, executive maybe, 
how important is it that I be involved in technology skills development and that, and that we create a connection to business outcomes? Like, is it enough to just say we're going to build skills or, or do we really need to know why we're doing this and, and what it's going to do for the business? Do we need expectations? Do we need to measure those outcomes? Oh, absolutely. You can't, you can't improve it if you can't measure it. I think there's the expectation with skill and, and, and what customer needs and wants are, because most of it, all businesses are, are in, in place to, to, to serve, serve customers. So I think the le- leaders are, are realizing that. And I personally believe that this COVID-19, the great pause that we've, we were all living through, is going to place an even, from business leaders, an even higher emphasis on whether you're a tech employee or not, uh, of, of, of understanding you know, customers and customer service and customer interface uh, because uh, as we've all gone off into our remote locations, uh, the customers have, have, have gone on and, and continue to do business with us or other companies that, that have platforms and employees that are more focused on, on the customer needs. But definitely it would have, it would have to be measured. But on, on, on another point that, that Eric and Tanya made, uh, that you know, the, 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 what leaders also have to do is they have to askew their traditional ways of onboarding, onboarding talent. Uh, you know, let's, let's put an 800 word posting up on Indeed.com for an entry level job with five years experience. That's just not working. And, 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 and Tanya's former CEO, I thought she did a great job, Ginny Romney, talking about this concept of new collar. And Eric was talking about digital badges, I believe. You know, new collar jobs. These are jobs that that not necessarily need a college degree, uh, but more than a high school degree. So we have to open up, executives have to open up their minds in terms of how are they going to uh, uh, attract and retain talent. It's not just the old way anymore of of, of hiring people with four-year degrees. So would you you say it's important that, I, I think at least in the U S there's a strong sense of if we need to achieve something and we don't have those skills, we'll just go hire them. Mm-hmm. Is, is this more about, I need to be able to build them myself. I can't just go hire them. Well, uh, if you're asking me, Don, yeah, I, I I'll just answer quickly. Let the others, uh, uh, uh chime in here. Uh, Harvey Nash put, put, put numbers on the, on the comment you just made. It's uh, Harvey Nash's executive recruiting firm. And they asked CIOs, 1,600 of them last year, you know, where do you get your talent? And the top three things like Richard, well, Richard Dawson doesn't do it anymore in Family Feud, but here are the top three answers, outsourcing services and contractors. You know, down the list, substantially down the list, are, 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 are upskilling you know, employees. Uh, so a lot of work needs to be done. So, Tanya, if... if- if I've got an organization, I've admitted that, okay, we, we need to be better at, at skills completely. Who in the organization ultimately owns the success of that effort? So it's a great, great question. And I will tell you one that we talked a lot about in IBM. Um, so f- from, from my, our perspective, we very much believe that in order for companies to succeed, you have to recognize that skills are the new currency. And with that, it's aligning all of your, you know, business processes, all of your programs around skills. And if you think about that, the HR organization is responsible for driving those strategies, but it's in deep, deep partnership with the business. And so what we, what we have found here is that with the way organizations need to transform around skills, there is a very new, very important role that HR needs to play that they haven't had to play in the past. This isn't about just setting up programs or, you know, making something better. This is about HR being a driver of change in partnership with the business. So it's, it's very much a partnership. Um, nothing that one, one organization can do on or without the other side of the organization, but that's really where we're seeing. It's when HR drives it with a very modern strategic mindset. And so who would, and, and I'll ask both um, um, you and Eric this, who are some of the other stakeholders? Like who needs to buy into this? Who, who really has to be connected? So from, from our perspective, if you, if you think about the, we use design thinking a lot 
So in order to make a certain experience happen, the first thing we want to do is not just kind of go out there and define what needs to be done and create a project plan around them, because that's the way we all used to do things. It's what's the experience that we want for our employees, for our customers, for our business leaders. And from there, it's figuring out what are the processes, what are the data, what's the technology underneath that that you need to have in place to realize that experience. So when you think about it that way, there's really nobody in the organization that's not doesn't have some role or is accountable. So from a CIO perspective, it's how do we have the technology, the infrastructure to support that. You know, we talked a little bit about HR, finance, in, you know, plays a very different role as opposed to always saying, no, you can't spend that money or you can only spend it on this. You have to partner with finance to invest in skills. Um, it's the employees because this is no longer a, a point of view where we as companies tell people what to do and they go do it. They own their careers. We have to support them in that. But you've got to get them to see this as their journey and to create an experience that they want to engage in. Managers, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it that way, there's really not anybody that's not responsible for skills. And once you do something, you're not done because those skills continue to change. This is just has to be part of the way we do business. Eric, same question. Who, who are my stakeholders? Yeah, no, I, Tanya said it really well. I mean, it, it's everybody. Um, I think you have to build it into your culture. It has to be part of leadership, kind of tops down, org wide, um, finance, IT, business leaders. And then you also need to kind of build it into your grassroots, you know, culture at the associate, you know, down and an employee level. So I think that's what we've seen is we, the goal is to put things in place so associates can go grab it and do what they need to and learn at their own pace and have continuous models. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a project. Um, there might be certain, you know, programmatic things that you put in place to try to scale it and, you know, make it as efficient and effective as possible for everyone. But it's a, it's a living, breathing, ongoing plan and a very big part of the culture all the way through. So we've got a question and it, it fits right perfect here, I think. And it's directed to Gary with so many organizations spread out globally, you get a lot of challenges from understanding how other cultures and other countries operate in terms of, of developing skills. How have you seen companies overcome those differences in culture to create not only better technology skills, but better cognitive skills? Uh, as you said, what we sometimes call soft skills, um, what can what can you do if you're a big global company to to help? I don't want to say break down cultural differences, but understand those and embrace those and, and make those part of your solution. That's, that's an excellent question. I don't have any you know firsthand information that I can point to on a particular country or what have you, but there is a realization that that uh, the public education systems in, in all in 180 plus countries around the world are very, very important in terms of, of creating a linkage between what is taught and what is employable. And countries and companies that, that are aware of that, uh, you know, act, act uh, appropriately to, to um, uh, have education systems teach skills that, that, that are going to be needed in, in, in the workforce. Uh, the U.S. as an example, many of the uh, viewers will be from the U.S., we, we particularly don't do a very good job in that area. And this has gone back 85, 90 years. This is not a new phenomenon that, that American students are, 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 uh, need to hone up their skills, particularly in math and science. Uh, this has been a story that's, that's uh, been told for, for a long time. So I want to ask the big question, and, and I kind of want to get everyone's perspective on this. What does a successful technology skills development effort look like? What is success? Um, Tanya, we'll start with you. So that is a big question for a little amount of time. Um, so Eric, you're probably coming up next. Fill in the blanks for what I leave out. Um, so I really think that success is a couple things. And, and when, when I talk to clients about this, I start with the basics. 
understand the skills you have, understand the skills you need, and then figure out how to close the gaps and, and coach for the future. And you can do that from an organizational standpoint as well as an individual standpoint. And then it's really setting up again that experience informed by, we very much think, especially when you're doing this at a scale, in order to make it interesting, engaging, the consumer level experience that's like when I go to Netflix or shop to Amazon, that it's suggesting something to me that's interesting. Um, you're creating and you're, you're really curating an experience of solutions to help me and help me not just take a class. It's to help me be employable and not just employed. So I can, I can think about, you know, I can start throwing out, there's things that we do around skills inference where you can use technology to infer the skills people have. It's using a learning experience system to personalize journeys, personalize path. It's serving up um, internal mobility options. It's, you know, so there's a whole ton of solutions out there, but I think that creating the ecosystem based on data leveraging analytics and AI are the pieces that we're finding that are really working from a company perspective. From an individual perspective, it's recognizing that gone are the days that anybody is going to hand you a piece of paper or write you an email that says, do these three things. And when you're done, check the box and we'll talk again in a year. You have to do this stuff on your own. You have to be willing to invest part of your weekend to continually remain up to date, to read a business journal, to take a course online. And that's not because your company is asking you to do it. It's because this is the world we live in and it's an investment in yourself. So Eric, what, what else does success look like? Yeah, I think um, that was all good. I, I think from my perspective, you know, your, your company success and the big initiatives that you're trying to deliver on, I, I think is another element that you kind of have to gauge. Are you delivering appropriately, going at the right pace? Do you have the right skills and people? Are you able to be agile and move people around and get them trained and up to speed on these different things and not have it be this giant event, you know, that needs to happen? Um, that, that takes a long time. I think you have to be able to guide and see three steps ahead and try to make sure you have the right things in place and you're providing encouragement and opportunities. And then I think we're seeing a lot of the population gravitate to that and be really excited about the opportunities. Um, so I think that's another thing is how do you, how do you make it something that people are going to strive for? Um, to Tanya's point and be able to go the extra mile and really do some of those things. And I, I don't think that's really been a problem as long as you have some of the right tools and technologies and, and things in place and kind of the right coaching, mentorship guidance to just make sure people know. And I, I think once they keep going and doing it, it's just then part of their DNA and it keeps going and the world keeps going faster and faster, just like all of our businesses. So it's every year I'm like, you know, can we really get more done than last year? Cause we're all running a thousand miles an hour and yep, you figure out how to go faster and figure out how to keep doing more. So Gary, what is, what does success look like for technology skills development? Well, it's, it's interesting, Don, listening to Eric and, and Tanya, uh, just to put a cap on it. Um, Again, I come back to what we're all going through here with COVID-19. And it's an opportunity to reimagine our businesses and reimagine what success might look like in terms of what skills we need to, to deliver success. But for me, in conversations I've had with CIOs, uh, you know, the whole internal and external customer satisfaction aspect is, is, is key as, in terms of measuring what, what success is. The customers will tell you, you know, what is successful and what is not, as will employees with retention rates and what have you. Uh, and the financial side, it's not quarterly or yearly or annual market share reports, is, is, is how, how satisfied is your customer base? Because happy customers tend to buy more. Yeah. So, Tanya, we've got a couple of questions here, and, and these are ones that, like, in my position, I get all the time. It's what topics are going to be big next quarter? Um, how do I decide what skills that I need to upgrade? What are your recommendations for skills? I want to pull that back about 100 feet. 
are businesses just not good at helping their folks understand what skills are needed or are folks just not good at, at looking out and, and seeing what's going to be needed or both or, or neither? So what we have found is that it's, it's kind of a mix. So businesses sometimes will know what those skills are, but they're not doing a good job transparently communicating that to the workforce. So transparency in all of this is key and it doesn't have to be super technical. I mean, we started with a list of what we called hot rolls and hot skills, you know, and that was, you would have thought we hung the moon just having that level of transparency. So some of it I think is transparency. The other part though is sometimes companies truly don't know or don't have consensus And so really, you know, we guide people to just start with that business strategy. And I know this seems basic, but we, you know, many of our clients struggle with this. Start with the business strategy. From that business strategy, what are the roles and skills that are most important? I think the other thing that we're finding is you don't need to handle all of those roles and skills in the exact same way. So really find the ones that are going to drive business success as you move forward, shine the light on it, and then transparently share those with your workforce. And if you do that in an engaging way with that experience I talk about, you shine that light, people go. You don't have to force it on them. You don't, it's that grassroots part that Eric was talking about. You know, I never thought in a million years our badging program was going to work. I thought it was kind of cheesy. And man, you put it out there and it was just, you know, it was people wanted that information so bad and really just gravitated to it that we've issued something like 3 million badges to date in a couple of years. And this is on, isn't on on silly skills. This is on skills of the future. So I really think as, as companies, we need to do a better job Um Right now with COVID, there are a lot of companies that have opened up their training. So for anybody who's on the phone who's you know on the webinar that's listening that wants to develop skills, it's a great time to go out there because stuff that used to be sometimes thousands of dollars is free. Um, IBM has a ton of stuff online that's free, as do many other companies. So it's a great time to take advantage of that skill building. Gary, what are some tips you would offer to a technology leader who's maybe just kind of getting started with the idea of skills being an ongoing thing. Uh, any, any particular advice to maybe help them think about it in a particular way or, or overcome what you've seen as common hurdles? Well, if, if there were such a person out there, I'd ask why weren't you thinking about skills uh, before then, but we'll put that aside. Uh, I, I would prefer to reframe it in terms of, you know, well, how are you going to, uh, see ahead to what the skills that you're going to need are. Uh, As an example, we've been talking about digital transformation for decades. And research I I recently saw is only 5% of companies are actually doing it, doing it well. And it's not because they don't know the skills. They just, I think there's a human reluctance to, 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 to move into new areas and look around the corner. And, you know, one of those areas uh, is, is, is quantum computing. Uh, that, that, that you're going to see a lot of Pluralsight has courses on, on this yet, but uh, Tanya's company at IBM, they're, they're, they're doing a lot of work in terms of quantum, and, but they won't be around until 2025. So how do you set up skills for that? And while work has to be done, and you saw you know, with the, the checks that have been coming to all of us uh, with the COVID-19 aspect, uh, I think it was Treasury had a, had a difficult time processing the checks because the COBOL systems were, were so, you know, it's like rubbing your stomach and patting your head. Uh, you got to, you got to train for new skills and, and, and maintain the, the uh, skills that have worked, worked for, 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 uh, for, for, for a very long time. I, as I don't think there's many people, Don, that, that, that I've seen who, who are not aware uh, as a technology leader of the importance of skills, uh, and I do think there's an awareness now that, you know, the buy versus build, uh, there's more of a interest in terms of my conversations with IT leaders on, on uh, you know, they're certainly going to buy, but, but internally build and reskill and work with public education institutions in their area, you know, to tightly connect, 
you know, what, what the education outcomes are with what the employment opportunities are. That, I think, is a, is a realization that techno- leaders, technology leaders are looking at. So, Eric, I, we, we work in a time with an unprecedented amount of tools and flexibility uh, in terms of technology. You know, we've got hundreds of programming languages that we can choose from depending on the task at hand. We've got multiple different ways that we can host and run services. Like it, it feels like the world is our oyster from what we can do. How limited are companies by what their people can do? Like, is, is skills causing companies to, to put off or make bad technology decisions just because they're concerned about their team's ability to, to bring it in? Yeah, I, I think every company is different, um, you know, and I think a lot of it gets back to culture, leadership, vision. You know, can you give people direction of where you're going? Can you serve up and provide them um, the tools and processes they need to, to stay current and agile in what you're trying to do? Um, so I think for the most part, as long as you have that built into your, your culture and your DNA and you have a mix of you know, guidance and direction from leadership as far as what your vision and strategy and where you're going, as well as you have these grassroots, you know, movements and and things in place that you can help go quickly, um, then I think you can kind of guide and navigate um, the waters and make sure that people are able to navigate. I I think in the question, a couple questions ago, what, what Tanya answered, I think we're good at telling people where we're going to some degree. There's definitely some variation there, but I think it's back to can you connect the whole company around that to make sure that you're paving the road appropriately and having everything in place versus, you know, certain parts of the company maybe weren't in sync and then it's causing a a roadblock of what you're trying to do. And I do think a lot of this COVID scenario has definitely forced companies to think differently and get some things in place and, you know, try to leverage technology more and more. Um, so I think it's really exciting because um, I think the rest of the world and all companies and all industries will now be forced to do this. And I think we'll see a lot of innovation and a lot of things go faster and faster. Tanya, one of the things you brought up a little bit ago was partnering with finance. Um, you know, we're, we're in a time now where a lot of companies are, are trying to protect their cash flow. Um, it seems like training, uh, and I'll use that word specifically, is one of the first things that gets chopped off. It, it's an easy thing to let go. And especially if your company hasn't found a way to show its, its value to the, the bottom line and the outcomes. Is there a, is there a budget formula or, or more broadly is, is how, how should companies be thinking about the money that it takes to build skills like yay skills, but it, it costs. Right. So I think one of the things that companies kind of had had to have to get their head around is their people are really investments. They're not just the money you pay out the door for their salaries. And if you start to think about it that way, there, there's a couple things. It's not like a new pot of money just shows up. There's no end of the rainbow where a new pot of money shows up. But at the same time, what we find with companies is that many of them still haven't cleaned up what learning they do have. They haven't digitized it, automated it. They're still holding too many in-person sessions. Um, the, The platforms, the business platform that they're running it on might be old. They might have 10 of them. So I think there's the the technology portion of it. At IBM, we got rid of our very old LMS system, our learning management system, and now use something that is half of the price of what we were paying. And, you know, the engagement and the results and what courses are being taken is through the roof. So if you engage in some of these more modern technical ways of doing things, you can actually save money. So it's understanding the ROI there. The other thing that we're finding is that looking at it from a portfolio perspective, there are parts of your business that have probably been doing things the exact same way for years and years. If you have a hundred step process, 30 of those steps might not even be needed. And oh, by the way, you could automate a ton of it. So by looking at automation and using that as a cost saving to fund other initiatives, that's another way companies are looking at things. So again, looking at it as a big picture and that that's a, that's a cultural change, right? So it's not just, Hey, learning organization, you go figure it out. It's as an organization, 
where are we spending the money? What results are we getting? And how do we collectively want to shift that? And Eric, same, same question, maybe different direction. When you identify a, a skill need and, and you set out to address that, how do you come up with the money? Yeah, it's a good question because uh, it does get into the partnership with finance um, and kind of understanding what the annual, quarterly, kind of ad hoc processes need to be around these types of things. So the the more you can kind of forecast what you're trying to accomplish as a business and what you're going to need to do it, um, it, it just directionally, you know, and kind of manage expectations along the way, then, then I think it helps. Um, so I think engaging them early and often in the process is what I recommend. Um, Cause why that might be scary to some, I think it's better for them to kind of see what you're trying to do and kind of see how it's going to play out and try to work that into some of the future guidance and planning from an expense standpoint as much as possible. And then, you know, Tanya mentioned ROI. I think some of these things are a little bit easier to measure than others. Um, but I think that's still a, room for opportunity probably of how should you quantify um, some of this stuff. And it won't be perfect, but th- there does need to be some kind of return for some types of things. And then other things, I think you just have to declare that your people are important. You need certain things in place. That's part of your talent, you know, retention and recruiting strategy. And that's just kind of the cost of doing business in today's world. Um, but then you're going to have some other things that kind of ebb and flow that you try to manage and plan for as best as possible. And, you know, it comes back to the business leader having accountability for their budget and making some of these things a priority too. So Gary, we're talking about a lot of cultural stuff. Like and these are, these are big changes for a lot of organizations and whether we like it or not, culture almost always starts in the C-suite. Um, it's, it's our top leaders that teach us what our company's culture is. Do companies need to think about making skills development part of their their vision, their mission statement? Like, is it is it that important? Does it start there? Oh, it starts and stops there. That, that that's that's the whole game. Uh, and 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 Tanya would, and Eric were talking about this a moment ago. For me, Don, the 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 starkest reminder of that was a study that was done by the Society for Information Management last last November just a couple of months ago, they interviewed about 4,000 uh, CIOs. And one of the questions they asked was, uh, what are, here's 30 different issues. Pick those that are most, the top five and most worrisome to you. In the C-suite, these are CIOs answering, the, C, the, the CIO said skills development was the 17th most worrisome issue. Wow. For CIOs, it was the third. Uh, so unless that, that gets aligned, you know, you know as, as Tanya was saying, yay skills, uh, it, it's, it's not going anywhere. And one of the other, one of the other conversations that, that I've had over the years with, with CIOs about skill development is that there still is, uh, not with all, but with many, a reluctance to, to upskill, reskill, because once a company does that, there's still this feeling that they'll leave and go someplace else. And, and uh, that, that's, that's unfortunate. So I'll, I want to piggyback off of that because we actually experienced that internally, Gary, as part of our IBM transformation about five years ago. Mm-hmm. And with our digital badge program, what, what we had to convince our senior leaders of was we were going to put together this badge program with the hottest badges and, you know, the hottest skills in the market. And then we were going to encourage our teams to post that socially. And we really had to talk through the fact that, no, that wasn't nuts. We weren't just putting people out there to be poached. We were investing in them. And what we were able to show, and that was a big dialogue, but what we were able to show is that in this world, you can't build your walls higher and think that people are going to stay. You have to make it a piece that people place that people want to stay. Mm-hmm. And what the data was ultimately able to prove is that engagement went up, a tr- voluntary attrition went down, our technical sellers, they doubled their, their results. But that is a very real concern is that we're going to invest all this money and what if they leave? 
And I think the data is starting to prove otherwise, that the number one reason people are staying now, provided you know, certain needs or other needs are met, is the fact that they feel invested in. And, and Tanya, if I could ask you this question, uh, this is for the audience, certainly not meant to be condescending, but you've mentioned it several times, and I think it's so, so important that if you would take a moment to explain it, uh, the whole digital badge concept of what it is and how it works. Sure, sure. Again, I was not a huge fan of this at first, but I give, um, I give the team who thought of the concept real credit because they saw a need of how learning was changing, a need that we're seeing real life right now, right? So everything's going virtual, people learn in different ways, and we all have this kind of a little bit of competition in us and we want to be rewarded. So digital badge programs are very, you know, company can create one themselves. There are badges that are out there. You can go get a badge from another company. It's free. And there are different levels of badges. Some of them are just for knowledge of a certain topic. Some of them, if you've actually demonstrated successful use, uh, we go so far as to have certified roles that align with external standards. And so it's a way to really signal to your workforce the skills that matter and allow them to go gain those skills and get recognition for it. That's great. Sure. Thank you. What, what else have you seen work in terms of, of kind of meeting that need, like engaging folks and, and filling our desire to, to collect and achieve and compete um, to, to move the skills you know, needle a little bit? No, I agree. It's definitely one of those cultural things that I think you have to really make sure leadership is on board and, and kind of understands what you're trying to do because it, it's a different way of thinking. But ultimately, you have to break down those barriers. You absolutely need to do it. Um, and I think you, it's kind of placing a bet and taking a chance. Um, but I think a lot of companies that have done that have really seen a lot of really, really um, good results. So digital badges, you know, is kind of one way, stickers on their laptops, you know, now maybe that's not as much if people aren't going to be walking around in person, you know, <laughs> as much as they used to. Um, but, you know, people go to conferences and, and do talks and then also get different things. So, so I think it's just whole the, the sharing of the community and the sharing of the knowledge and the continuous learning and just anything that you can do to create some visibility um, and connection, you know, across peers and individuals to be able to do that. I think it's really fun. It's kind of like having a workout partner or team sport or, you know, there's different analogies um, that I think kind of fit into this too. It's just the continuous learning version of that. We can all walk around with little uh, like Boy Scout, Girl Scout badges sewed into our yeah, shirts yeah. and dresses. Uh, <laughs> everybody would, would uh, I want to go around uh, and just give everyone a chance to kind of, you know, offer one last thought on, on the broad subject of, of technology skills development. And, and Tanya, we'll start with you. I think the biggest thing here is from an individual perspective and an organizational perspective, we can't hide from this. If you are not currently actively thinking about how you have a personal skill plan and as a company, understanding the skills you have, understanding the skills you need and what you're going to do to create a learning culture, you're, you're already behind the game. So invest in yourself, invest in your people, because your personal results and your business results really are going to depend on it. Tanya, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And Eric, we'll go to you next. Yeah, no, I would agree. It, it has to be a focus. Um, you have to make sure that there's buy-in at different levels of the organization. It needs active, ongoing conversation. It needs to be on people's placemats and initiatives, and it needs to be well-connected and then I think communication with your population um, is really, really important. Um, and then somebody said it earlier, but I think just the connection to the community and the schools and everybody around the community, um, I think is another connection. So we can make sure that people are starting this culture early on. And then it just naturally kind of comes into the workforce that way. Because I think that's a big part of it is today we still see a lot of having to ingrain some of this into people as they come into the company. And we want to build that bridge and make that easier as that transition happens from, you know, college or another company into your workplace. Eric, thanks so much for your perspectives. Really appreciate it. Uh, and Gary, we'll give you the last word. Oh, thank you, Don. Um, just three brief things. One, uh, the realization that talentism is the new capitalism. 
Second, this is a lifelong journey in terms of skills development. And third, individuals are going to be primarily responsible for that skills development, not just businesses or schools, uh, what have you. Uh, those are the three takeaways I, I see as we move forward. That's great. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody who joined us live. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for joining us for the conversation. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for listening to All Hands on Tech. You can find show notes and more info at pluralsight.com slash podcast. If you're interested in reading or listening to Perspectives on Technology Skill Development, we've included a link in the show notes to access the book for free. 